you so much. Nehemiah, fourth chapter. Nehemiah, the fourth chapter. Nehemiah, the fourth chapter, verses one through six. Nehemiah 4, verses 1 through 6. Look what it says. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he exploded in anger, vilifying the Jews. In the company of his Samaritan cronies and military, he let loose. What are these miserable Jews doing? Do they think they can get everything back to normal overnight? Make building stones out of make-believe. Next verse. At his side, Tobiah the Ammonite jumped in and said, that's right. What do they think they're building? Why, if a fox climbed that wall, it would fall to pieces under his weight. Nehemiah prayed, oh, listen to us, dear God. We're so despised boomerang their ridicule on their heads have their enemies cart them off as war trophies to a land of no return don't forgive their iniquity don't wipe away their sin they've insulted the builders we kept at it repairing and rebuilding the wall the whole wall was soon joined together and halfway to its intended height because the people because the people had a heart for the work King James said they have a mind to work dealing with this series for the next couple of weeks a mind to work come on put your hands together for the word of the Lord a mind now, I get asked a lot because y'all make it obvious with your cars parked all over everybody's grass outside. I get stopped quite frequently uh, by different individuals. They're asking, what in the world is going on at your church? Why so many people? Especially in a time where things have changed for the church. Uh, not just uh, post-pandemic, but pre-pandemic. We find it now that times have changed. People don't go to church like they used to. And if you look at many churches, a lot of them uh, probably got one to two generations sitting in it. That in a few years, in a few decades, some churches will be extinct. If you really look at it, at one time, the Methodist church was kind of bumping and jumping. Every denomination has had a season in church. Everybody say church. Here's the problem. Here's what we don't understand. Jesus didn't come to establish religion. You can't find it scripture nowhere that he was part of a certain denomination. He wasn't ostracized. He wasn't set aside. He wasn't by himself claiming to be the Baptist, claiming to be the Methodist, claiming to be Church of God and Christ. No, he came preaching the kingdom of God. And I think a lot of that theology and a lot of that doctrine had got lost in teaching because now it's hard to get people in church. People don't want the rules. They don't want to have to have to wear dresses down to the ankles. Don't want to have to not put on their makeup. And they don't want to put the doily on their head. And why do they have to come to church with a two-piece suit on with a big Bible up under their arm just to say they belong to the church? And a matter of fact, you can't even get the young people In church, and we wonder why we can't get them in because we're stopping them at the door. They can't come in if they got tattoos here. They can't come in if they got piercings in their nose. They can't come in. We're practically trying to clean the fish. And if you were like me when I came up, I was on the drug program. No, I wasn't strung out on drugs. No, but I got drugged to church. 
It was a rule in grandmama's house that when we came down from the summer, no matter how far we, we went that Friday, that Saturday, no matter how long we hang out at, at that time, it was called the beer joint. Y'all ain't helping me. I'm going right here. No matter how long we hung out at Lee's Lounge in Marion, Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning, you better not even pretend like you were going to lay there and didn't hear her. She didn't call it gospel back then. She said she was listening to her spirituals. Spirituals came on the radio. We weren't even allowed to run in the house while spirituals were on. And we had to get up and we had to get up and before we walked out and go to eat breakfast, we had to wash our face, make sure our, you better not got to came in the kitchen and didn't have your face. Come on, y'all. And we were going to church. Listen to me, there wasn't no children church. We were sat right there next. And on the way in, if she thought we were going to cut up, she broke her little branch. Come on, y'all, help me. And if we got too restless and too hungry, she went in a purse and got a peppermint that tastes like peppermint and perfume. And you sit between her and her cut, her cut, cut Lizzie, cut whoever it is, and you sandwich right in between them and you can't move in some kind of way. The Lord made a way. Yeah. No children church, no sign of no church in. You were right there. Didn't know what you was clapping for, but you were clapping. And then if you got into a good service and the mass choir was singing or the gospel, somebody went and passed out. And if you were old enough, you saw them take off a shoe and try. Oh, they got the smelling sauce to try to wake them up. And if you hung around the summer long enough, you were there for the summer revival. Come on, anybody know the summer revival? Yeah, your clothes are already laid out for the summer revival. Back then, they had the morning banks. Y'all quiet on me. I'm telling my age. The corn, anybody know what I'm talking about? You had the morning bench. And, and you, if you got up and got on the morning bench, listen, you were on there not until the Lord spoke, but until the old folks said you were ready to get up. And if you attempted to get up, they said you ain't ready to sit back down. And if you were on the morning bench, you can play baseball. Come on, you can watch cartoons. Come on, because you're supposed to be sitting yourself aside, waiting on the Lord to speak to him. By the time the end of the revival ended, then you can get up. And you better not have been caught playing around because you say, I know you're sitting there playing with the Lord. Look at you, playing with God. You ain't ready. All of those things God winked at and allowed us to do it. But listen to me. It has to be something more than that. There has to be a relationship. There has to be a work that God has assigned you to do while you're here on the earth realm to establish for him. Your life is no mistake. I don't care how you think you got here. I don't care what you think your parents didn't do or what daddy and them didn't do or how they didn't stay together. You have an assignment on your life just like Nehemiah and he took his assignment seriously. We cannot walk this world, walk this earth aimlessly. And not put our hands to work. The numbers are startling. Over one third of America has never attended church. No. They're getting into other things that are giving them peace and tranquility. Over 50% of our churches, I told you, may have one or two generations before it's extinct. And they're trying to figure out how do we get more young people back in church because our kids are traveling and rubbing their heads through collegiate hallways they're moving abroad and never returning because the church failed to change listen to me hairstyle change cars change clothes change even you have changed and the church stayed in one spot you go to some now they're still doing two songs in one prayer help me out and they'll still get up there and look around as if they don't know who's going to do the prayer. 
when they already discussed it in the back. <laughs> the kids have more technology on their phone than we do in some of our churches. And the church is supposed to be the nucleus of the community. In the 60s, the civil rights was a movement because people came to the church to get the information, took it back out to the communities and voted to, uh, registered to vote, went to school, got their education. And now the church is the last one to transform because the people can't see the work. And watch this. Let's not forget our kids that do go to college. Half of them, when they leave to go to college, over 30% of them never go back to church. Some kind of way along their college journey, they've been introduced to something else. They're some type of philosophy, some type of other doctrine that moved them away from the body of Christ. And here's my concern because we all have kids. I have kids that are in college. My concern is that once they leave my house, have I deposited enough in them? That if they move to New York, there's a church, there's a body of believers that remind them of home. That can continue the education and continue the relationship that we've established with them and their Lord and Savior. And my trouble is, is that I don't think that we have too many that remind me of what we've already started. That if we're not careful, we're going to run our young people away from church instead of them running to God. Can I get an amen right there? Because watch this. Here it is. You can't scare them to go to church now. <laughs> you can't even scare them to do right now. It was a time you scared, you, you tell the child, but look, see, all right, sit down. I'm going to pop you on your tail now. They will sit down. Now these kids now, you can threaten them with whoopings. They ain't moving. They used to be able to scare us with hell. You remember that? Y'all don't act right. You're going to hell. <laughs> these kids, these kids, they, they built different. These kids so bad, they are sitting here with an ice glass of water and look at you. <laughs> you can't scare them. It has to be something that ignites their, 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 their interest to keep them involved in the body of Christ. Listen to me. They don't care nothing about steeples and pews. They don't care nothing about crusaders and sunbeams. And somebody know what I'm talking about. They don't care nothing about sunbeams and red circles. They know, I don't think when the last time they saw choir robes and them little uh, shortbread cookies and juice that you had during the uh, uh, summer Bible, summer. They want to know, they want to know how they can be used to stomp out poverty. They want to know how do they eradicate social justice. They want to know how do we deal with racism and police brutality. How do we deal with ostracizing ourselves from other ethnicities when we all should be children of God? They're going to classes. They're sharing dorm rooms with people that don't look like them. And they want to know how do they love even, and even with their differences? How do they come together and actually relay the love of God that we sing about and we preach about? They want to know the cure for cancer. They want to know how do we get into community revitalization? What's going on with mental health? How do we eradicate the student debt? How do we get rid of welfare? Why should we have welfare? What do you mean everybody don't have the right and the access to proper health care? What's going on with wage inequality? Why in the world do we spend millions of dollars on stadiums and we got people living on the street? Voting rights and voting restoration. When do we put those type of works into the hands of our future leaders that we're educating and training them to take over? Asking them to take the baton and move forward. It has to be more than religion, more than church. And if you really are taught your Bible correctly, you'll understand that Jesus came to come against religion mindset. 
It was a law that you couldn't have issue for a long period of time and be accountable, accountable into society that you had to move outside the city. It was a law that if you had lepers and you couldn't be healed, you could not live inside the city limits. It was a law that if you got caught in some type of sin, ideally adultery, you had to be stoned to death. It was a law. But he came against the law. Maybe this will help about five of y'all shout. I'm asking you, when are we going to establish a relationship between us and God that will stop hindering people from loving God no matter where they are in life, no matter what their mistakes are, no matter what they've done, no matter what sin they're wrestling with, they have a right to the access of God. They don't want church. I'm coming to my text. They want to be touched by something they can put their hands to. That they feel like they're making a difference. They want to belong to something. That when they look back at it, they say, yeah, I remember when we delivered groceries to that house. Or I remember when we went to this school and we delivered school supplies. I remember that young girl that I mentored. Now she's the lawyer. Now she's the young girl that's scoring 30 on the ACT. Now she's getting accepted into middle school. I remember that young man. I didn't know he was playing basketball. Now he's being drafted. Now he's some judge. Now he's some lawyer. We ought to be able to be like Jesus and be able to put our hands on something. And when we put our hands on it, it don't remain the same. We ought to be able to walk in the room and just by the sound of our voice, we ought to be able to establish the relationship between the people in the community and the body of Christ I'm not talking about a denomination yeah we are a Christian church but I won't be restricted by whether or not you believe in oneness or you believe in the holy trinity I won't be restricted by whether or not you carry a bible you got to wear a dress down to your ankle I won't be restricted whether you got two songs and two prayers I just want you to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and give blessings unto his name I don't care So watch this, Nehemiah, everybody say Nehemiah. Nehemiah, Nehemiah, this book along with several other books covers over a hundred years of post-exilic period where the people were in exile in Babylon, in prison in Babylon and Babylon is a worldly type of system, any system that forces you to work for them and it doesn't benefit you is bondage. I'm going to say that one more time. Any system, just like being in Egypt when Moses and the children of Israel were in Egypt and they were building the cities for Pharaoh. They were slaves to that type of economic system to where they only got what Pharaoh gave them. They didn't have a right to work for nothing else but the man building his kingdom. And Moses went to Pharaoh and said, you got to let That they can go and worship God and establish themselves for themselves for the kingdom of God. And understand this, that Pharaoh gave, God gave them favor with the people of Pharaoh that they were able to go to each neighbor and borrow. Somebody say borrow. Borrow from the neighbor. And when they cross the Red Sea, God wipes out Pharaoh. Wait a minute, I thought we borrowed from Pharaoh. You did borrow from Pharaoh, but God wiped out the debt. Y'all didn't catch that right there. That if we're going to establish the kingdom of God, we're supposed to be living debt free. I understand you got bills and some things you got to pay on, but we shouldn't be in bondage that every day you wake up, you wake up to pay somebody else when you ought to be paying yourself. So here it is, after 70 years of exile, they're coming out of bondage. They're coming out of the Babylonian exile, being in bondage, and they're free now. And here it is, Nehemiah has a job working for the king. Somebody ought to caught that right there. That he's next to the king. When the king moves, he's moving. He was a cup bearer. His job was to make sure that the king's cup never was infiltrated by somebody trying to poison him. Nehemiah 1.11, put it up on the screen for me so I can hurry to my clothes. Look what he says here. He says, Lord, let their ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him, somebody shout favor. Come on, shout favor. He says, favor in the presence of this man, I was the cup 
cupbearer to the king. He understands that he's getting ready to go in here before the king because he heard of the destitution in his homeland and he knew his position with the king. He says, grant me favor. Can I help y'all out? I thought about three of y'all would shout on this part. The reason why they can't stand you, they can't see it, but it's on you. You have favor. I, I want to talk to about five of y'all in here that before you go into your job, you already know that they sabotage some stuff. You already know that there are several meetings about you. You already know that there's several emails about you. You already know that they don't like you. They're saying your personality is clashing with the corporate vision. They're saying that you don't speak to nobody. They're saying you look like you got an attitude, but they can't deny the fact that there's a favor on your life, that every time you get the work done every time there's a deadline you meet your deadline and even though they got one spot for the promotion and 12 people for applicants some kind of way your name shows up you can't help you got the degree you can't help that you got the experience you can't help that the favor favor of God is on your life. I wish I could get about seven of y'all sitting in the atrium to shout favor. favor. Yeah. So my life, he's next to the king. He, he's high ranking. He, he, he has a position of great honor. He's a cup bearer, kind of like the baker and the, and the butler and Joseph when Joseph said, hey, remember me when you get in your spot. And it was them that was able to remember Joseph and remind Pharaoh that there's a man that's down there in prison that interpret our dreams. I promise you he can help you. No, y'all didn't catch. You got to be careful how you treat folk when you down low because you never because you never know you never know you better be careful how you speak to folk at the gas station they may be the person that's sitting in the admission office at the college your child trying to go to you better be careful Joseph said Joseph say in prison Joseph said remember me can I just pause, can I pause to say something right there listen I don't care where you are baby use what you got Joseph was in prison working that thing. Interpret the dreams. So here it is, Nehemiah, he's the king's cupbearer. He lived in the king's palace as a servant in God's house, the king's house. He moved among dignitaries following the king. Y'all didn't catch that, man. He, his social circle was different than normal people. Y'all still don't catch that. Some stuff that go on at work because of who you are and because of your favor on your life. I didn't come right through here. You can't go to lunch with everybody. I'm going to help about five of y'all save y'all jobs right here. Listen to me. Understand this. I don't care what mess they got going on at the workplace. I don't care how they don't like the supervisor. I don't care what they're getting in arguments about. Because of who you are, some stuff you just need to step back from. Until you can get a clear picture of what's going on. Because it may be the words that's coming out of your mouth that's going to save everybody's job. Because you don't get into a whole lot of stuff. His occupation, his job, watch this. And the favor on his life put him in place to help people. Can I talk to y'all? Think about your job. Think about how many times your job was used to help some young person. Think about your job. Think about how many times your, your position, your voice with the supervisor, you being the boss, you were able to say something to change a decision for somebody. Don't you think that's God got you in that place for a reason to open doors for people that normally wouldn't be open? Oh, I tell anybody, I tell anybody that go to Shelton, I say, hey, you got problems, go see Dr. Logan, go see my wife, go see Dr. Evans, go in and just tell them what's going on. I believe that God put us here that we can open open doors for people how dare you go through life and don't reach back and help somebody how dare you get through by the grace and mercy of God and get there and turn your nose up as if you made it on your own like you are totally qualified how dare you not reach back that's what the church is supposed to be doing let me come to a close his occupation says look here 
He's in the circle with the king. Can you imagine the conversations he's heard in the room he's been sitting in? And required to be quiet. People will go off on you in these rooms. Did you hear what I just said? When you got the favor of God on your life, folk will cuss you out. And you got to stand there sometime. And they don't know you have the power and the favor to destroy everything they got. And you got to sit there and smile. Can I help y'all out? Y'all think Cat Williams told the story. He ain't just had receipts. You got the favor. You got the receipts and the register. You can listen to me. The favor of God on your life. You have to smile at wickedness sometimes. People in public service, school teachers and principals. We got parents that go up to the school and go off. Y'all quiet. Go off on the teacher as if your child being bad is something new to you. Your child was bad before they left the house. You was arguing with them that they didn't take the trash out, went to bed with the dishes in the sink. Can I help y'all out? We couldn't go to bed with the dishes in the sink. And if you did, you got woken up with a lick. Let me get let me get to it. Let me get to it. Your position, your position by your position. Nehemiah was positioned by God. One day while working in the palace, he overheard people discussing the ruins of the wall. Nehemiah 1 4. Put it up there for me. I got five minutes. I got to close. Put it in Nehemiah 1 4. Look what it says. We don't have it. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fast and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah had unselfish sorrow. This was not about him, but yet he was concerned. We cannot keep driving through our neighborhoods, keep watching our young people fail, keep watching families go down the drain and drive through like we don't. We have no concern. Even though no one died in his family directly, he was not stripped of any luxury item. He was not named. His life was not in jeopardy, but yet he had a concern. He could easily say this has nothing to do with him. I'm straight. My family's straight. My kid's straight. Let him get it out the mud like I got it out the mud. But this was not him. He asked the king for favor. Nehemiah 1-2 says that he pours the king's wine. The king noticed his countenance. He noticed his countenance. He said, well, what's wrong with you? You sick? Look at somebody say, you sick? How is it that you letting your problem change the fact that you connected to the king? Did that help somebody right there? How is it that you're going to let life make you think of the issues and the circumstances when you're standing in the king's face? It was against the law to get in front of the king and look sad. It was an insult to him as if he wasn't providing for you. From this day forward, don't you dare put a frown on your face because you don't have money in your account. Don't you dare walk around worried. How God going to pay the bill when God is trying to teach you to be disciplined with your money. Don't you dare worry about the promotion and how he's going to open the door. The king notices his countenance and says, why are you sad? Why are you poor mouth? Nehemiah 2.2 2 says, he says, are you sick? What's wrong with you? And I want to ask the proverbial question to you. What's wrong with you? You are acting like he didn't bless you in 2023. So he says, are you sick? Nehemiah 2, 4 through 7. Put it up here and I'm coming to a close. Nehemiah 4 through 8 says, the king said to him, what is it? <laughs> I thought somebody would clap. You mean to tell me the king is asking you, what do you want? What do you want? What do, what do you, not what you need. Because the king providing your need, what do you want? Come on, he gives you your daily bread. What do you want? And listen to me. I came to tell you, you serve a big God. So the time for thinking small is over with. I need you to get your mind out the box. I need you to think outside the box. And God is asking you the question today. What do you want? 
ask your neighbor, what do you want? He says, what do you want? Then I prayed to God in heaven. Next verse. Give me the next verse. And I answered the king. Look what it says. If it pleases, if it pleases the king, let me help you out. The one rule to success is don't be on your agenda. Be on God's agenda. Come on. If you want to see, if you want to see perpetual success in your life, make, your, make God's agenda your agenda. If you want to see success, make feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and giving sight to the blind your agenda. Make sure that you're putting the groceries on the doorstep because you want to glorify God. Make sure you're helping people financially because you glor- if you got to help them and brag about it, keep it in your pocket. I'm coming. He says, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor, the test of your favor is this. And the sight, let him send me. Somebody say, send me. Send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so I can rebuild it. If there's favor on my life, take me back to where you brought me out of and let me go back and make a difference in the life of those that I left behind. Now, you may be thinking the city, the physical city in which you grew up in, but can I talk to some folk? We left some folk in the club. Can I talk to some people? We left some people in the streets. Can I talk to some people? We left some folk outside of salvation and I came to tell you you have an assignment this morning that when you leave out of here I need you to go grab one cousin one uncle one auntie one friend and bring them into relationship with God he says he says so I buried go back to my ancestors buried so that I can rebuild it my question is what are we going to reestablish it's time for our communities to get back upright. Then the king said, when the queen sitting there, and I shared with them at 9 a.m., that queen most likely is Queen Esther. Because Queen Esther had favor with her king, and it was during the same time frame that Queen Esther was reigning, that this queen was sitting next to this king. And so here it is that he says the queen is sitting beside him. Listen, can't go wrong with Esther in the room. Huh, Tremaine? Can't go wrong with Esther in the room. <laughs> When Queen's sitting beside him and he asked him, he says, how long will your journey be? How long will it take you and when will you get back? And he said, if it please the king, send me. So I set a time. Next verse, seven verse, I'm coming in. I got three points like a real good Baptist preacher and I'm out. He says, I also, t- I also said to him, if it please the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans Euphrates so that they will provide me a safe conduct until I arrive. Here, here, here is my first point that I want to put out that if you want a test of the favor of God on your life, Nehemiah moves. He has permission. Oh, God, look at somebody and say, I got permission. I got permission from God to be doing what I'm doing. I got permission from God to be able to move through some things. Listen to me. He got a letter from the king. And though we don't have a letter, some of us brought our Bible. I think I saw somebody walking here with a Bible. Is there anybody in here? You got a word from God. Come on here. You got a word from God that allow you to go through dangers seen and unseen. You want to know why you're unstoppable. Look at somebody and say, I got a word from God. He got permission. Favor with letters. Military say he has orders. And once you get orders, you can't cancel those. And see, some of us, that's the problem. You've been trying to cancel the order that God has already placed on your life. You've been trying to live in another direction and God said these orders have already been spoken. I said you was blessed and highly favored. I said you was the head and not the tail. I said that, listen here, that at the sight of you, you can put a thousand to flight. But if you ever hook up with somebody, you'll run 10,000 out the room. Look at your neighbor. Your neighbor, we got orders. The next one is Nehemiah 2.8. And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the royal park, so he would give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city of the wall. Here's my second point. Not only do you have permission, somebody shout permission. Here's the next one. You got provision. Ah, yeah. 
Listen to me. He's not sending you on the journey empty-handed. But if you go ahead and take one step, God will already provide. That he said that he will send a letter to the next king and when you get to the next kingdom that that kingdom will open up its gates to you and give you whatever you need. I need to help somebody right here because some of you you're trying to get it all right now and get it all in your pocket right now. God said I need you to bust a move. I need you to get up and do something. If you'll step out I promise you every door that's been closed in your face. Every person that ever denied you. Every person that ever told you that you you couldn't do it I promise you when I send this word ahead of you this word is going to grant you permission I came to tell somebody that if you just live until tomorrow have I got a witness here if you just live until tomorrow God has already made a way for tomorrow you ought to high five your neighbor and say no I can't quit right now I can't die right now I got to get up and do something is there anybody in here God has already granted you provision yeah if you look back over your life whether they cut you another check or not you got a testimony that God has been good to you you got evidence that you look over your life God has made a way out of no way can I close with this right here Ooh. <laughs> he got permission and now you got provision the next verse says verse 9 says this so I went to the governors of the trans Euphrates and they gave them the king's letter I didn't have to say nothing God had already sent a word I didn't have to prove anything God had already sent a word I didn't have to open my mouth when I showed up they knew who I was representing can I tell y'all something you sometimes you ain't got to say nothing just walk in the room and folks know who you are all you got to do see the problem is some of us don't show up but if you ever show up God will show out in your favor I'm closing he says not only do you have permission not only do you have provision have I got a witness here but verse 9 says that I sent some folk with you that you cannot see. I'm going to send not your friends. I'm going to send not your cousin them. But I'm going to send some folk that are known to win a battle. Have I got a witness here? You won't have to fight this time because I sent some folk to fight for you. Have I got a witness here? I'm going to send my army with you. Yes, and they're going to do the fighting. If anybody raise a hand to you, just step back and allow my cavalry to work for you. I just need somebody that got their eyes open that if you can look to the hills from whence come your help look at your neighbor your neighbor all of your help comes from the Lord have I got a witness here your last word is protection you want to know the reason why the enemy couldn't destroy you you want to know the reason why the devil couldn't take you out there's a host of angels encamped around you that every time you try to fall in a ditch an angel will sweep by every time they try to set you up and they try to open up a door that allowed you to meet your demise an angel will close the door I dare you to look around this room there's angels waiting on you is there anybody in here you know that God got protection over you cancer got to bow down to you high blood pressure got to bow down to you being poor got to bow down to you is there anybody in the atrium you know you got God's provision you know you got God's permission and now you got God's protection you want to know how you made it you got God's PPP plan you've been here 
because of God himself. Are you ready? Tell somebody, I'm ready. I got a mind to work because he's a mind regulator. He's a heart fixer. Do you know him? Have you tried him? Do me one more favor. High five your neighbor. Grab him by the hand and say, neighbor, we got work to do. We got to build our family. We got work to do. We got to keep our home. We got work to do. We got to raise our children. We got work to do. We got to manage our money. We got work to do. Our life has definitely changed. I may not be where I ought to be, but I thank God. Do you thank God? Let me see if you thank God. If you thank God, you ought to wave your hand. If you thank God, you ought to stand on your feet. If you thank God, you ought to say yeah. Say yeah. I'm not where I used to be. I've come a long way. I don't go where I used to go. I don't hang where I used to hang. I don't cuss like I used to cuss. Is there anybody that's up in here? You change for God. Say yeah. Say yeah. I'm mine to work. Greater faith. Are you ready to work? Are you ready to work? You're probably asking me, Pastor, what we're about to do? We're about to feed the hungry, give sight to the blind. We're about to clothe the naked. Say yeah. Say yeah. Yeah. Ah! Are you ready? Are you ready? I want you to go get them. Go back and get your friends. Go back and get your family. Go back and get your auntie and them. And say, we got work to do. West side. Somebody shout west side. Somebody shout west side. Here we come. Somebody shout Alberta. Here we come. Somebody shout Demopolis. Here we come. Uniontown, here we come. Yeah, 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 yes. Woo! Are you ready? Somebody shout, I'm ready. Somebody shout, I'm ready. I gotta go get them. Go back and get them. Go back and get all of them. Go back and get them. Be a blessing. No more church. Singers. No more church. It's kingdom. While you rest on your feet, here's what I need to tell you. Church has members. The kingdom has citizens. You got to be able to move from being a sheep. Can I say it? You got to move from being a sheep to being a son or a daughter of the king. Let me explain to Church wants you to remain a sheep. Because you got to be led to eat. You got to be pampered. You got to be... The shepherd got to be there. But when you're a son or a daughter, you have a right and you have access. A sheep cannot get inheritance. But a son and daughter can. Are you a son or a daughter of the Most High? And if you are, then nothing is withheld from you. This is what's not being taught. Because if you remain, a sh the devil don't mind you coming and following the shepherd. But when you start taking residency and you start owning.